Greek, I should know that. I have to say, I always am happy to be presenting in Greece because I always say people can pronounce my last name, but <laughs> well, almost. Gatsi <laughs> Zagarias. So, yeah, my name is Alexander Gatsi Zagarias. Um, I am uh, what some people would say a mudblood. I'm half Dutch, half Greek. I grew up on the island of Kos. I don't know if anyone has ever been on Kos. Two people. You should definitely go there. Completely unbiased. I've been very drunk. Oh, well, me too. <laughs> um, I work in the Netherlands for a company called JDriven right now. And I work on a project at the port of Rotterdam as a backend uh, systems engineer. I have a couple of hobbies. I like bouldering. I have a way too expensive Magic the Gathering collection. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it costs a lot of money. Um, and I play a lot of games, and by a lot, I mean like a lot. I grew, I basically grew up in World of Warcraft. Um, yeah. Um, and I have a, a kind of passion to always chase uh, the new shiny thing. And roughly years ago, that was, uh, well, generative AI, it's still kind of shiny. Uh, but I, the, what was under, under uh, generative AI is what really drew me to it, and those were vector databases. I came from a, uh, I come from a little bit from a gaming background as well. I studied games, so everything that has to do with vectors, with algorithms, with math, you know, it's I'm like a moth to a flame. So I started dabbing into uh, vector databases, seeing, okay, what are they? How do they work? Uh, build some things around them, and I'm going to show you some stuff today, and hopefully inspire you to do exactly the same. And that is also my goal with this talk. Hopefully, you know, maybe you'll be the next somebody here is going to be the next person to revolutionize an industry. You know, who knows? All right. Before we get into vector databases, we should talk about vectors. Who knows what a vector is? Who? Uh, any mathematicians here? Ooh, one person. So I, I, I can't. Ooh, two people. Okay, I can't say whatever I want. <laughs> I'll be fact-checked. So if I say something stupid, feel free to shout. Um, so mathematically speaking, if you look up for vectors, uh, you'll see that notation, like a letter with an arrow on top of it. Uh, and the vector is a, a actually a representation of a direction and uh, a distance, pretty much. It's encoding those values uh, in it. Uh, in gaming, vectors are, or in also geometry and gaming, vectors are used you know, to represent a position of an object, but they can be used for a million different things. Um, vectors have different dimensionalities. So if you hear, okay, a vector has a dimensionality of two, that means, uh, well, it, it's two numbers. A dimensionality of three uh, means it's three numbers, and a dimensionality of like eight means like eight numbers. Um, but we can simplify this for ourselves. Uh, I assume all of us or most of us here are software engineers. You can just see it as an array of numbers. And uh, if the length of the array is eight, you have eight numbers. If it's three, you have three numbers. Pretty simple, right? Now, so what do we do with these vectors? Roughly 10 years ago, in 2013, was the first uh, uh, transformer model that grabbed something like this, text, and transformed it into its vector representation. So an array of X amount of numbers that represents that text. And after text, of course, came images. So they grabbed images and they translated it into its, the vector representation. And right now we are in a state in the industry where uh, software engineers all around the world are trying to vectorize more and more things. So from audio to 3D models to all kinds of space uh, sound data and you, and you name it, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and this uh, vectorization happens through the use of machine learning. Uh, anyone that uh, has dabbled in uh, machine learning before? You know, played a little bit, opened up TensorFlow, did some cool things. One person? That's, yeah. uh, it's pretty cool and it's pretty easy uh, nowadays. Um, but uh, the models uh, that are trained to vectorize uh, your data from text to, let's say, it, it, to its vector representation, an image to its vector representation, those are what we call embedding models. So if you are going to open AI and you open the open AI API uh, and you see an embedding endpoint, that is an endpoint that you can send your data to and they will return to you the vector representation of that data. Um, there are a lot of vectorization techniques uh, nowadays. Uh, the, fir the first one was Word2Vec, uh, published by Google in 2013. Uh, a couple of years later came Glove, 
and this, uh, but these models had a huge problem that didn't understand context. So a word with different meanings always had the same uh, vector representation, uh, which really doesn't make it very usable in most of your you know, in most cases. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, it was the transformer revolution. Uh, transformer models were uh, 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 released, like BERT and then later CLIP. And these models actually understand context. So a word with different meanings has a different vector representation based on its context. And that means that you can indeed use that vector representation to uh, create large language models like ChatGPT. All right. So that is about vectors. Now let's talk about databases. Who here has no idea what a database is? <laughs> One person? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> um, OK, good thing I'm going to explain to you what a vector database is, at least. Uh, it's a purpose-built database. It has one purpose and one purpose only. It's not like uh, uh, Postgres or whatever. And that purpose is to uh, store and retrieve uh, high-dimensional vectors. Uh, the higher the dimensionality of a vector or, or your vector representation, the more accurate it is. So the more dimensions you can store uh, in your database, the better. Um, a lot of vector databases now support uh, typically 512, 1024 uh, dimensionalities, but there are some other that go up to in the millions, which is pretty cool. Um, and retrieval and indexing happens using so-called nearest neighbor search algorithms. More on that later. Uh, and of course, you can store all kinds of metadata next to your uh, vector representations, and you can use that metadata to uh, build your UIs, build whatever you want. Um, so that is what a vector database is um, in uh, high over. All right. Um, if, let's say, you are working at, uh, in your project and you have a very tech illiterate uh, product owner who comes to you and says, OK, what are I am keep hearing this vector database thing, what are they, do we want to use them? Uh, then I would give uh, this answer. Uh, it's a database that facilitates effortless and swift semantic search on your data, and semantic being the keyword here. Uh, that means that you can uh, uh, create a natural uh, language interfaces to your data and you know make it a little bit cooler or more uh, hip. Um, so, uh, in Postgres, for example, uh, who here uses Postgres, for example, or MySQL, stuff like that? Um, who uses a graph database out of... No one, huh? Poor an A4J. Um, indexing in vector databases happens with quite complex algorithms, um, which are na nearest neighbor search algorithms. It's not the only way, but it's the most popular way. And, of course, you have things like linear search, uh, which is uh, uh, array.find in Java, pretty much, and then it does a linear search, uh, which you can imagine doesn't scale very, uh, very well. You have things like k-nearest neighbors, uh, which is also pretty popular. Uh, uh, shout out to Spotify for calling their, their algorithm approximate nearest neighbors, oh yeah, uh, the annoy. And my personal favorite, I never imagined I would have a favorite algorithm, but anyway, my personal favorite, favorite is hierarchical navigable small worlds. Uh, and I'll show you how they work uh, in a little bit. Um, and all these databases have something called a distance metric. And that is how they're indexing and they retrieve vectors. Whenever you put a vector in it, it calculates it, the distance of the vector uh, to other vectors and indexes, indexes it uh, appropriately. Uh, can be things like Euclidean distance or similarity, cosine distance, having the dot product. The, math the two mathematicians here were like, oh yeah, I know all of this, uh, probably. Uh, the, other, uh, the, the other people here might be, okay, wh what the hell is this? Um, uh, Euclidean distance is something you probably all know that is basically our metric system, uh, meters and centimeters, stuff like that. Um, and the use, uh, <laughs> and they, Distance calculations and indexing always happen within the same so-called vector space, and that has a reason. Um, so that means uh, you can define your vector space by a schema or by table, by object, or you name it. Uh, uh, every database has its own way of defining the vector space, uh, which is like a table in uh, your a relational, a relational database. Uh, but they do that to enforce that calculations and distance metrics always happen uh, with a, uh, against the same dimensionality. 
So that means that if you have vector stores that have a dimensionality of 512, you do not check, it, check them against vectors with a dimensionality of 384, for example. It is possible, but the math doesn't really compute that well. You're going to get a lot of uh, inaccuracies. So they just say, let's just not allow it. Now, when talking about um, uh, vector space, uh, being a game myself, I was, like, I was like, I can probably build my own vector space. So that's what I tried to do, to visualize my data sets. <laughs> so this, is, uh, this planet uh, is one uh, data point in the database right now that I put in, uh, which is um, labeled as Longbow. Uh, why that is, you'll see in a bit, <laughs> I guess. Uh, and if you fly around, uh, fly around, you'll see more planets, which are all their own data points. Now, I will admit, this might not be the most user-friendly way of looking at your data. It is the most fun way to be looking at your data. Uh, but if you look around, these are all the data points right now. Uh, and what you really want to see is, if you look at this data point, uh, it's uh, the data point for uh, WIP. Uh, here we have an axe, uh, here we have an uh, Beretta uh, and uh, a Webley. Um, and what you'll notice is uh, things that are similar or similarly uh, vectorized end up close together. And that is exactly what you uh, want to see. Uh, so that if you look at your data, clusters are going to be formed of things that are similar. That means that once you start searching for things that are going to end up being similar with what's already in your database, you'll find, you actually find the words or the objects or the data you're searching for. All right. Um, the vector database ecosystem is huge, uh, really huge. It's growing by the day. There are a lot of them. Uh, everybody, it's really a gold rush. Uh, if you keep track of GitHub, it's re every day there's somebody new that releases a vector database. Uh, these are, I think, some of the biggest or, or most popular uh, ones right now. Um, the question I always get is which one uses uh, OpenAI? Uh, as far as I know, they use Pinecone. Um, and of course, all the big uh, SaaS uh, providers have their own vector store uh, nowadays. Uh, what's probably interesting for you is uh, everything on your right side is open source and everything on, the, on your left side is closed source. Elastic, with their Elastic uh, Vector Store, is a little bit of an interesting situation. They say, okay, we're, we're not closed source, but we're also not open. So figure it out yourself. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so if you, you probably, if you want to dabble into this, you want to grab an open source uh, database. Um, then what's really interesting, some of them uh, offer so-called built-in embeddings. Uh, that means that the database natively will grab uh, your objects, vectorize them, and store them in the database. Uh, if a database doesn't have built-in embed embeddings, that means that you manually have to do calls to OpenAI or some other service, like a Honeycomb service or whatever, to vectorize your data and put it, and then get your vectorization back and then put it in the database. So that's a little bit of an extra step you need to do then. Uh, and then finally, uh, of course, you want to be querying your databases. Uh, first thing, I mean, Python is the language of AI and machine learning. So all of them have a Python client. Uh, so it was a bit redundant to put it up in here. Uh, Pineco, Milhus, uh, Qdrent, and Elastic, you can call, and VV8, you can call through a REST API. Uh, some also have a JavaScript client or for CLI. Uh, Postgres has the PG vector uh, extension that you can use, which you can query through SQL, uh, as in text AI. And Vespa, you can query using YQL, which I think stands for Yahoo querying languages, uh, language, uh, which is definitely a choice to make uh, for your querying language for your uh, data store, for your vector data store. Not one I would have done, but you know. Uh, so that's a little bit the ecosystem. So let's get to the, I hope, the fun stuff, actually implementing our own search. Um, okay, uh, so for our stack, we're going to use uh, VV8 uh, as the vector store. Uh, for our backend, we'll be using a Spring Boot Kotlin uh, uh, application. Um, Kotlin is the superior GVM language. Change my mind if you can. Um, and for the front end, we'll be using Unity 3D. Uh, who knows Unity? 
a lot of people actually, I mean, first, who has actually done something with Unity? Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> I just hobby with it. Uh, Unity 3D, for the people that don't know, is a game engine. So, um, yeah. Uh, I chose VV8 because it's completely open source uh, and has some paid cloud services, of course, for them to earn money. It's completely modular, so you can run all kinds of Docker uh, instances next, next to each other for the vectorization, uh, which allowed me to really uh, pick and choose uh, which uh, embedding uh, modules I want to use. Um, their documentation is actually pretty decent. I was surprised. And their Java client is also pretty decent, which, again, I was surprised. Uh, I only had to dig into the code like four or five times, and the amount of what a fox per minute was pretty low. Uh, and, but most importantly for me, uh, it can run completely offline. I can do this completely offline, which being at a conference like this on stage, you know, uh, is pretty important. Uh, you know, you don't want to mess with the demo gods. And uh, the architecture for the demos is pretty simple, I think. Uh, we have a, the, our Spring Boot. Uh, backend uh, has the VV8 client library in it, uh, which just does some calls to the Docker instance where VV8 is in, and then through REST uh, HTTP we call our backend. Uh, any architects here? Or any aspiring architects in here? Because I've had uh, the, or the remark that um, why have a backend uh, if you just can REST call uh, VV8 directly through your frontend? And to that I say, sure, but I'm a backend engineer and adding abstraction layers is literally my job. So I will keep doing that wherever I can. Okay, so today uh, we'll be using uh, so-called cosine distance uh, for our distance metric. So everything that is, gets vectorized or distance checked is gonna be used in the cosine distance. Uh, the hierarchical navigable small worlds as our indexing algorithm. Then we'll be using a BERT model for text vectorization, uh, a ResNet 50 model for image vectorization, a CLIP model for same space vectorization. Well, that all is, you'll see in a little bit, but you know, just maybe a mental uh, note. Uh, this is the algorithm, uh, or this is how you write down um, cosine distance. This is the uh, algorithm. Um, it is maybe a little bit, uh, well, mathy. Uh, but what's more important for you guys is if the distance come out as 0.0, .0 uh, that means the two vectors are identical. And if uh, distance comes back at two as 2.0, that means the two vectors are completely opposite. Um, so if you have like a Java class uh, file and a C-sharp class file and you vectorize them both, then it's going to be like 0 0.0001 because those two languages are pretty much the same, right? And if you have uh, a JavaScript uh, well, not a class file because they don't do that there. Uh, and a Java class file, and you vectorize them both, they'll probably be uh, close to, well, 2.0. Uh, unless somebody did something very, very wrong in their Java class. All right, and then uh, hierarch the hierarch our indexing uh, algorithm, hierarchical navigable small world, it's a little bit of a, a tongue twister, to be honest. Uh, it's a little bit trickier. Uh, to explain, so I try to do it uh, like this. Uh, these are all the data points that we want to be en uh, entering, inserting our database. So what this algorithm does is it grabs, uh, for each data point that is being inserted in the database, it does a proximity scan around it. Um, and then it connects itself to, the, to an X amount of closest uh, vectors or data points. Uh, and like that, uh, like that, you can see it builds uh, a so-called adjacency graph. So, or a neighbor graph or a, a friend graph. It has like a million names because in software engineering, we are, we are very good with naming things. Um, and it, it does that uh, for every point that is entered. Now, eventually, um, once a lot of points have been entered in the database, uh, there's a random chance that a point is going to be duplicated into a second layer. Uh, and in that second layer, uh, pretty much uh, the same thing will happen. Uh, and a smaller friend, uh, friendship or agency or neighbor graph is going to be created on top of your very dense uh, uh, bottom graph. And then eventually, I mean, you can, you can tune this however you want. 
there's going to be a third layer in our case uh, with another uh, adjacency graph on top of it. So we have a multi-layered graph, and the top one is this, the least dense one, and the bottom is the most dense one. And then let's say we're going to be searching for a vector, uh, which ends up here, that, that would be his position. Um, then we have an entry point at the top side of our uh, least dense graph, and then we're going to go to the nearest uh, vector, and then use that nearest vector as an entry point in the, in the second uh, layer, and then again search the nearest vector to our destination, and then do it a third time. And like that, you can find uh, your, well, your destination vector in milliseconds time. Um, so then if we add everything in there, you can see, uh, as you can see down here, we have a very dense, uh, very interconnected graph. Uh, and we simplify it multiple times and multi multiple times. And then if we search uh, again, it's going to start from the top, go to the nearest vector, use that as an entry point in the lowered uh, graph, and then again, go to, the, to your actual destination vector. And this is the vector or the data point that is going to be returned to us. Uh, which, for me, is a very cool way of solving the issue of uh, looking through millions and millions of uh, data points in your database to give you the closest one to what you're actually searching. All right. Um, if somebody, does somebody uh, recognize what this is supposed to represent? The matrix, yes. Well done. Anybody that has not seen the original Matrix? Everybody has seen the Matrix? God, I love Greece, man. <laughs> um, so yeah, there is a scene there where N Nero uh, asks for a lot of guns, right? And then he gets a lot of guns, but there is, there is a plot hole. How is he ever going to find the gun he's searching for here, right? So we're going to help him. So we have a little uh, data set of a couple of weapons. Um, and it's labeled like uh, weapon. We have three properties, the name, the type, and the range. For example, the name is Excalibur, the type is sword, the range is short. Uh, and then uh, once we vectorize it, what's going to happen is it's going to concat this into one string, lowercase it. So we're going to have weapon, Excalibur, short, sword. Um, you, if you want, you can even choose to uh, vectorize the property names. That means that we would have weapon, name, Excalibur, type, uh, type, sort, range, short. And then using a transformer model, we vectorize, vectorize it into 384 dimensions. Uh, oh, whoops, spoiler alert. Uh, all right. So. Uh, we have uh, Nero in, um, asking for the guns. Uh, Trent is like, no, don't do this. This is not uh, a good idea. Uh, but it was a really good idea because it gave us one of the best action scenes ever made, let's be honest. Um, that's a weird question, I know. But does somebody have a favorite weapon? <laughs> yeah, sure. An M16. Do you play Call of Duty by any chance? Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, I need an M16. <laughs> oh, an M15. I don't think I have the M16 in the database. So if we look uh, at our actual uh, data set, so these are the weapons. Uh, M6, no, I do not have an M16, sorry. Uh, but it found the next nearest thing, which is an M15, which arguably is pretty close. Uh, as you can see, the distance between what we search, uh, let me zoom in, uh, the distance between what we searched is uh, 0 0.3 and what, uh, what it found. Anything else? With a missing texture, by the way, apologies. Anything else? There can be only one player that, play, that plays Call of Duty in here, right? A Kalashnikov. A Car Carcano. I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I don't know what that is. But we can, we can do also things like uh, a Japanese weapon, for example. And then you'll get an Odachi, which is indeed a Japanese weapon. I mean, it sounds very Japanese. Um, last one, anyone? Yeah? Escarel. 
do you have a scar? This is what this is what you, how you write it, right? I also play Call of Duty or played. <laughs> there you go, and you can, uh, and then you find it. Now, what's really nice about vector databases, at least in my opinion, so because you can see the distance between the scar and the scar L that we search for is pretty high, but that is also because of the natural way I expressed my question, right? Um, now, what's really nice about vector databases, in my opinion, is that uh, because the indexing and how approximate nearest neighbor algorithms work, uh, you, you, when you do a query, you can never be sure what you get out of it. So there's a little bit of gambling involved, uh, so to say. So given, given a certain uh, input, the output is always going to be the same, but you never know what that output is going to be. You can't be sure that if I had, for example, an M16 in my database and I searched for M16, that I would actually get the M16. And to me, that makes vector databases amazing. You know, a little bit of uncertainty. Do we have, uh, by any chance, anybody that plays Dungeons & Dragons here? You were ready for with a with hand. You saw the picture. It was like, oh, it's coming. <laughs> um, so yeah, Dun Dungeons & Dragons, popular uh, role-playing game. Or Harry Potter could also work. Uh, so in this use case, uh, we're having, uh, I put all the spells from Dungeons & Dragons into the database. Um, and we're going to help a, forg a forgetful mage to uh, defeat a thug that is trying to get, uh, well, let's say, rid of him. Uh, and we're going to do that using a bird model again. All right. Um, well, you like Dungeons & Dragons. Give me a spell. To beat the thug, yes. Scorching, Scorching Ray. Scorching Ray. Let's see what the distance uh, was for this. Uh, da, 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 0 0.4. So pretty good. So if you, but uh, what's kind of interesting here, um, because our data set was very uh, convoluted, so it was like a CSV files with, uh, which was pretty much parsed for computers to understand them uh, as we, well, as if it was adjacent, uh, so to say. That didn't really create a very natural way of representing the spell. So what I did is I uh, said to my database, okay, I don't want you to vectorize uh, all these properties. I will only want you to vectorize the name uh, of the spell and the description of the spell. And then uh, what I did then is create uh, a description that is a very natural, a very natural way of, uh, so like this, um, um, a very natural way of describing the spell. So this is the spell, this can be used by this and this and this and this. Um, this is the level. So, it, so it's not like a silver bullet which will solve all your issues immediately. It, it will probably need some data preparation. Uh, and then we can, of course, uh, cast a Scorching Ray and uh, kill our thug. All right, one more. Anyone? Yeah? Uh, Array of Sickness. Of sickness. What, uh, how about I want to make him sick? Let's see. Ray of Sickness, there it is. And again, uh, it's the same animation, but uh, we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. All right. Um, who, everybody knows Pokemon, right, I assume? <laughs> Good. Uh, anybody played this uh, gem of a game? Uh, <laughs> no, right? So it's a very weird game. It was for Nintendo 64 and the GameCube as well, I think, um, which already is old stuff. <laughs> uh, and you were on rails and all you had to do is take pictures of Pokemon and throw apples at them or something like that. It was so weird. Um, but we're trying to recreate it uh, with a little bit of fear of being sued by Nintendo uh, here. Uh, so we have uh, Ash that really likes to flip his uh, head whenever he does anything. Uh, we're going to be taking a picture of uh, the Pokemon uh, we see, and then we'll be using it, sending that to the database, and uh, hopefully find the Pokemon we're searching for. Uh, if you look at our icons, there are uh, oh, these are the wrong icons. 
like this. Let me close this up. So this is, for example, who is this Pokemon? Bulbasaur, right? Oh, no, this is Bulbasaur. I'm sorry. And this is? And a really hard one, this is? All right, so. Uh, this is uh, Ash, just like in the cartoon, right? Uh, we walk around, uh, and this w should be Pikachu, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to take an image of the screen. We're going to send that image to the vector database. The vector database is going to do an adjacency test and hopefully find uh, Pikachu. There it is. And if you look here, uh, the distance was 0 0.28 between the image that we sent and the image of Pikachu, this uh, image. Um, and so let, let's make it clear that the icons were not tagged in any way or whatever. The only tag I have is uh, the name of the Pokemon and then the icon, pretty much. Um, anybody knows this one? B drill. Okay, let's see if we can find it. No, I'm sorry, it's print plup. Pr print plup, yes. So something, if, so something goes wrong here, right? Let's try it again. And now it's bergmite. So, <laughs> so as you can see, it's not a, a solution to all your problems uh, immediately. Uh, so, for example, what's happening, uh, what the issue is, is if you look at all the uh, icons, there are uh, 2D icons on a white background with one pose and one uh, uh, from one uh, perspective. So that means that if your vectorizing doesn't understand what a Pokemon is, doesn't understand the context, okay, this is a Pokemon, uh, it will just try to vectorize based on colors, transparency, pose, and stuff like that. So that means whenever you take a picture or you submit a picture that is, doesn't really match that, it's going to have issues finding that. So to solve it, uh, you just need to spend a couple of million to train your own uh, Pokemon uh, model. Or you submit more icons, right? More perspectives, different icons, uh, not only 2D, but only three, also, also 3D. Uh, so, if I, for example, had just to taken a lot of uh, pictures uh, from different uh, perspectives of these 3D models that I use now, I could probably make sure that it's at like 100% uh, success rate. Uh, last one, does anyone know which, which this one is? Yes. No, it's Joltik. <laughs> but what... Maybe the very perspective and observant people uh, here uh, might have noticed that the Pokemon that is found is always has always a yellow tint uh, in it, um, and that comes uh, that is because I did a little hack. Um, so on the bottom right there, that is what the image camera sees, and that yellow is a very specific type of yellow that is the Pikachu yellow. Uh, so basically, what I did is make sure that the camera can always find Pikachu. <laughs> while having trouble with other, uh, with other Pokemon. Uh, and that is because, once, uh, because again, once, if the vectorizer doesn't, doesn't understand the context of the image, it will default to poses and colors and stuff like that. Um, and that means uh, if you really want to make it accurate, you really have to supply different, different angles, different poses, uh, different styles, uh, and, st and things like that. So that is something to consider if you want to play with it uh, yourself. All right, uh, so we are back to our uh, uh, wizard, our forgetful wizard, which is so forgetful that walked uh, a circle and is exactly back where he was a couple of minutes ago. Uh, but this time we're going to make things a little bit more uh, gamey. Um, uh, so w once again, we're going to be searching for a spell. Um, but once we found the spell, we're going to get the name of the spell we found and put it in an icon database. Uh, where we're going to try and find an icon that matches the spell uh, that, we, uh, that we search for. Uh, and that was also a little bit the spoiler you saw before. So 
here I have uh, like oh, I have like 500 or so icons. It's like uh, like this. So they're pretty pretty good icons, pretty high def, pretty nice. Uh, I bought them uh, when I was like 18 out of a humble bundle. My mother said, "Why are you wasting money on this?" Well, ha. Huh. Um, uh, yeah, so we're going to search for something and hopefully we get a matching uh, icon. Uh, here, all right. The first one I'll do myself this time because I have, uh, every time I give a presentation, I want to uh, at least show an explosion once. So that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, a fireball. A classic Dungeons and Dragons spell. Uh, and as you can see, uh, so we searched for a fireball, we matched a spell named fireball, thankfully. We grabbed the name of the spell, fireball, we put it in our a icon database, and then it found an icon that I, I would say would be considered a fireball, right? And then if we cast it, well, and that is my explosion quota reached for today. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's pretty cool. And the icons, they are completely unlabeled. So not even a name, they only have a number, like icon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I just put them as they are in the database, and the database, or the, the model, uh, by opening AI, it's called Clip, uh, analyzed, vectorized it, and now you can ser actually search for these icons using uh, text. And that is what we call uh, a multi a uh, multi-vectorial uh, space uh, model. So it can mix and match texts and images in the same vector space. So anyone that wants to search anything? Now is your time. Yeah, go ahead. OK, go ahead. Cloud kill. Uh, I don't know if cloud kill is in there, actually, but we have stinking cloud, incendiary cloud, and storm of vengeance. The first one. It is not an actually storm of uh, <laughs> whatever, but it is a different color. Because what I do underwater is I have the icon, I grab like the, uh, the blues and the reds and the greens out of the icon, calculate the average, and then show a particle effect that matches that average color. So if we do something green, for example, uh, like protection from poison, we're going to kill them with, by protecting them. It's going to be a green puddle, uh, for example. All right. So uh, anyone that wants to try and break my demo? <laughs> oh, suddenly, yeah. Uh, can you do create uh, water? <laughs> Uh, I can create or destroy water, <laughs> or shape water. Which one do you want? Okay. Apparently, it was purplish, the average color. <laughs> and uh, anyone else that uh, dares to try and break my uh, unbreakable demo? Resurrection. Resurrection. <laughs> hmm. There, there's not a spell that's called Resurrection, right? right? I want to resurrect him. That's how you write Resurrect, right? Alter Ceremony and Regenerate. Regenerate is a, resur a Resurrection self. Alter self also kind of. Uh, well, oh, that's a lot of text, never mind. <laughs> Which one do you want? Oh, all the colors of the rainbow. <laughs> oh, but he broke his back on the way down. <laughs> all right. Um, so, yeah. Um, does anybody recognize this? Do, is anybody here that is a heavy metal fan? Oh, a couple of people. Anybody here that really hates metal music? Okay, good. And, uh, so, I'm a huge, uh, I, I really almost exclusively listen to heavy metal. Uh, and I like this idea, or a problem, that every time I want to uh, shazam a metal song, 
uh, based on the lyrics and you know maybe look at the lyrics it has no idea what's what the lyrics are because they're grunting difficult to understand and I was like what if I put like a couple of hundred or more songs in uh, in my vector database so we have songs by Beyonce which is not metal by the way uh, Billie Eilish Coldplay Ed Sheeran Lady Gaga Post Malone uh, whatever and then we have three metal songs in there uh, one by Metallica Dragon Force and Death Clock um, and what I want is uh, play the music and have, find the song that is playing based on the lyrics. So on the left side, you can see the transcribed lyrics. So what the AI, I'm using OpenAI Whisper for this, thinks is being said. On the right side, you can see the actual uh, lyrics that are being heard right now. And the top, you can find, you can see the title and the artist of what we are matching in our uh, vector database right now. Uh, so, place your bet. Who thinks that we're going to find the song easily? Who thinks no way you'll find the song? Who thinks it depends? <laughs> well, there are the software engineers. <laughs> All right. So now it's transcribe it in song, loading it into memory, and then. And this is, of course, the international coffee anthem. Taylor Swift. <laughs> I don't know necessarily. Beyonce, Ed Sheeran. Coldplay, getting a little bit more rocky. Selena Gomez, okay. Interesting. A lot of Lady Gaga for some reason. And what's really funny is a guitar solo apparently sounds like Ed Sheeran. <laughs> or with, with and you, you. Uh, so as you can see, uh, not even close, not even once. Uh, so to that, the only thing I have to say, if Skynet uh, if becomes a thing, the AI revolution happens, they start hunting us. All we need to do is start grunting to each other and they have no idea what we're talking about. And they're going to be easy to beat. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, that was what I had to say. If you have any questions, uh, hit me up, and uh, if you want, uh, feel free to uh, rate the session on the Vox Days app. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's uh, quickly uh, try that out. Uh, I'll make it a bit faster for you. So Kalashnikov and M16, right? So this is without the vector representation. Oh, M15, yeah, check. There we go. So you have the M15, you have a Glock, you have a Carcano, a Carabiner, and G28. So what ha happens at the water is actually this becomes one vector representation. Well, I don't have the, I don't think I have the Kalashnikov in the database. Uh, we found the Karkano uh, when I, we searched for Kalashnikov. So, so maybe uh, probably let's see if I uh, because this is what you wanna uh, right. So we have the Karkano here and the M15 there. What's interesting is the distance of the Carcano is much, but that is because it's a much bigger word, because it, be, it becomes one vector representation. Uh, so the bigger word or the tokens that are dominant are going to be closer to what you're searching for than to tokens that are uh, less. Sorry, it's cor if it's correct? 
Yes. Sure, sure, whatever you want. But, but I use the CSV file as input into the vector database. Uh, so the entries in the CSV file are being inputted, vectorized, and being put in the vector database. VV8. So, yeah? Uh, that is the thing, but you are sacrificing uh, accuracy with dimensionality reduction, right? So the the 3D uh, in, uh, the 3D representation you saw of my data points, I used uh, dimension feature protection dimensionality reduction to put them bring them back to three uh, dimensions instead of 384. Um, sorry. Uh, also possible. I'm not really. Uh, I haven't used it myself, uh, but that's also possible. But the the issue with future projection, dimensionality reduction, stuff like that is you are sacrificing uh, accuracy for speed, pretty much, because uh, smaller vectors are easier to find, faster to find, uh, but less accurate. That's uh, pretty much the trade-off you're doing, right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it, it, it is not the same search that happens when you search in Google, for example. Uh, it's a more uh, semantic way of, you know, searching for your... Uh, because uh, have you ever used Elastic uh, uh, and their, uh, how they search? They really, you know, they are scoring the search criteria based like that. So that is not what happens here. All that happens here is, okay, this is the text you're supplying me which vectors in the database are closest to the text that you are supplying me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So my, yeah, yeah, you can do that. So if you can create a combined search that is half or 60% vector and 40% like your traditional ELK, uh, whatever uh, scoring, uh, B, uh, BM25 uh, search, uh, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so, for example, I have the, the distance is uh, at a max of 0 0.9 here, so everything that falls over that, uh, I don't show. Exactly. It, the five closest. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. See you again in, in Ioannina at some point in the future. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thank you.